Well, welcome to a week three of a six-week sermon series that I've entitled The Blessing. And it's based upon the Aaronic blessing that's found in Numbers chapter 6 that is oftentimes used as a benediction in a worship service. And it's the benediction that I have used for 40 years of pastoring, and yet I had never preached on this text. And I thought it was extremely apropos, especially for the days in which we live, because so many people just aren't feeling blessed these days. They've got physical problems. They've got financial problems. They've got relationship problems. They've got emotional problems. People just don't sense the power and the presence of God because they haven't sought it. And so we're taking it phrase by phrase through this Aaronic blessing, and it began with, may the Lord bless you. And I took you back to the prophet Haggai and made, you realize, made us realize that blessing begins with a decision. It blessings are based upon obedience. In the book of Haggai, the prophet said, said, from this day forward, in other words, draw a line in the sand, I am going to decide that I'm going to be in the blessings of God. And then last week, we talked about that second phrase, and the Lord bless you and keep you. That we're living in a bubble. Uh, we're living in a protective bubble that's been created for us by God that he desires to meet us where we are, meet our needs, and to protect us from all that the world is trying to throw at us. But now I want to go to that third, third passage. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. You know, in Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. You see, that one passage tells us that our blessings are authored by God. They begin in the very heart of God, and they are available to us in our relationship in Christ. And so I want to ask the question this morning, does God wear a mask? Now, I'm sure that some of you may have picked up your worship guide this morning, saw the worship title, and then uh, the message title, and go in, okay, what's the pastor going to get into today? Uh, does God wear a mask? Well, prior to COVID, the primary reason to wear a mask was to conceal your identity. It's made me wonder, you know, who would know whether a bank was being robbed today or not, since we all wear masks. Um, but the primary reason for wearing a mask pre-COVID was to conceal your identity. But now since COVID, the primary reason for wearing a mask is to prevent your transmission. Now, a little bit of uh, medical knowledge here, which I have practically none. Uh, I remember when I got my doctorate of ministry degree, our second grade daughter at the time told her second grade teacher, my dad's a doctor, but not the kind that can help you. And so, uh, you know, medical knowledge of which I have none of, but my understanding is my mask protects you and your mask protects me. I am not wearing a mask so that I prevent from getting a disease. I'm wearing a mask to prevent from spreading a disease. And so the reason in which we wear a mask is because we care for other people. So it's a way of saying, I care about you. Matter of fact, the CDC reports that the probability of transmission of COVID is reduced to 1.5% if the carrier and you are both wearing masks. And so the reason in which we're promoting it, the reason in which we're sharing it, is that we want to be people that are responsible and don't want to spread any disease. Now, I have to be very honest with you. Our COVID task force debated back and forth whether we're going to require masks or not, or we're going to, uh, uh, you know, request masks when we reopened our worship experience. And so we decided that we would request masks. And here's one of the reasons why. The county health professional, Dr. Audrey Arona said, there is a greater complicity when we request masks and all leaders comply. But when we require masks, almost everyone will find someone who wants to go against authority. And so what we've said is, our leaders are going to wear masks, and we're going to request everyone else to be a part. So we're wearing masks to prevent from spreading something we may have. So back to, wait a second, does God wear a mask? Well, I go back to, does God wear a mask? 
The Bible says in Psalm 80, verse 3, Restore us, God, make your face shine on us so that we may be saved. God doesn't want to conceal his identity, and God does want to affect you with who he is. And so God does not wear a mask. God wants to shine upon you. And the only reason that God would ever have on a mask is because we put it on him because we don't want the world to see him. That's the problem. Is that we've tried to muzzle the very blessings of God. Numbers chapter 6 has been our passage for the last few weeks. I'm going to ask you, those of you that are in the auditorium, to stand together with me. We're going to repeat it together outside, out loud. Would you say it together with me? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Now, would you remain standing for just a moment? My scripture text today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 4. In chapter 3 and chapter 4, Paul writes how that we are to seek the face of God and for him to shine upon us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. My prayer today is that his light would shine upon you and that you would see the face of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, I pray your blessings on the reading of your holy word. I pray, God, that you would use this time as the time in which we would seek you and that we would see you shine upon us. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you would, please take your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians 3 and 4 if you haven't already done so. And I want to share with you two scenarios. One in the latter portion of chapter 3 and the other in the beginning of chapter 4. And the first is when his face is shining. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul gives us three characteristic, characteristics or evidences of God shining his light, shining into our lives. And the first way that you can know that God is shining in your life is that we are confident. In chapter 3, verse 12, it says, And since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. We're not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily until the end of the glory of what was being set aside. And so the very first key word that I want to share with you in this passage is the key word hope. Hope leads us to act, acting in boldness. It leads us to making decisions that are dependent upon God and desiresome of his will. We sing an old hymn that says, Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. And so the Bible tells us that we can have hope even in the midst of our life, even when things are going tough. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4, it says, For whatever was written in the past was written for our instructions, so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures. The Bible that you have in your hand is a message of hope. It has been intended to give you the ability to endure afflictions and to be able to deal with all situations. The Bible says that we have hope in life. But the Bible also tells us that we have hope in death. Last week during the pastoral prayer time, I shared with you some lamenting of some folks who were dealing with some really difficult times. One of those, my sister-in-law, her baby sister, was in intensive care unit in a hospital in Virginia. We got the call last night. Regina went to be with the Lord. My heart is heavy for my sister-in-law, for her entire family, for her parents that are in their latter 80s to the loss of a child, for Regina's son, who's a junior in college. I, I just, my heart just bleeds for them, for her husband that's been 
left behind. And yet I'm reminded that in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, the Bible says, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep so that you will not grieve like the rest of the world who have no hope. I've been doing funeral services for 40 years. The most difficult ones that I've ever done have not been based upon age, not been based upon sickness. They've not been based upon lifestyle. They've been based upon people who do not have a faith in Christ and are grieving from a position of no hope. The Bible says you and I as Christians are going to be sorrowful. In the shortest verse in the entire Bible, the Bible says Jesus at the death of Lazarus in two words, Jesus wept. Jesus grieved. Christian sorrow is permissible. It's okay for us to sense sorrow. It's okay for us to sense pain. God created us this way that we would miss someone and that we would hurt when there's been death. Christian sorrow is permissible, but Christian sorrow is peculiar. It's different than every other sorrow in the world. Whenever you find people that are grieving, whenever you find people that are lamenting, Christians grieve differently. That because our Christian sorrow is permissible, it is peculiar because it is passing. It is only temporary. It's only for the here and now. There's a reuniting that is expected in heavenly places where we get to be together for all of eternity. And because of that, we grieve from a position of hope. I am able to live with a sense of confidence because the Bible says in life, in difficulty, in despair, I have hope. And even in death, I have hope. And so, the second thing, we're cleared. We are cleared. We're confident in that we have hope. We are cleared in that we've been set free. In verse 14 and following of the text, it says, But their minds were were hardened for to this day at the reading of the Old Covenant. The same veil remains. It's not lifted because it is set aside only in Christ. And yet still today, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. If the primary word in that first section is hope, the primary word in this section is the word freedom. In some translations, it uses the word liberty. It's the idea of no condemnation and no guilt and no worry that Christ has established us and set us free. A man owned a large cage. He filled it with captured birds. He agitated them, poked at them with a stick. Matter of fact, he had so enraged them that he was basically teaching them to turn on each other and to fight. Another gentleman came and saw his cage filled with birds, and he says, for what purpose do you have them? And he says, I have them for my own pleasure. He says, I just love making them fight with one another. And so the man asked, could I purchase your birds? He said, they weren't for sale. He says, well, what would it take? And so the man looked at his inquisitor and said, I love your jacket. Would you be willing to give up your jacket? The man thought to himself he had paid a great deal for the jacket, but thought it's really not me, and so I will give it up. And so he took the jacket off and gave it to the man and purchased his birds. And I'm sure that you're probably already ahead of me. Because once he had purchased the birds, he set them free. You know, the world's agitated us for years. Satan's encouraged us to fight with one another. And for some, we have fell into the trap. But Christ paid the ultimate price. He didn't give the coat off his back. No, he was willing to put stripes on his back. And the Bible says, with his stripes, 
we have been healed. And he set us free from the power of sin. He set us free from the penalty of sin. And when we die and arrive in heaven, we will be set free from the very presence of sin and never deal with it ever again. John chapter 8 and in verse 36 it says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, Paul also said, It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again with a yoke of slavery. Why would someone who's been set free allow themselves to again be enslaved? And so confidently, I can handle things with boldness because I've been cleared. I've been set free from the penalty, the power, and the presence of sin. But the third thing that happens when Christ shines upon us is that we're converted. Look what it says in verse 18. And we all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror of glory of the Lord and are being transformed from that same image from glory to glory that is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The key word in the 18th verse is the word transformed. It's the word metamorpho. It's where we get the word metamorphosis from. It is literally a word that means to be changed from the inside out. And I'm sure the Apostle Paul was thinking about his own conversion experience when he used this phraseology. In Acts chapter 9, we learn about how Saul was saved and became the Apostle Paul. In verses 1 through 8, he's on a road to Damascus for the purpose of persecuting and killing believers, killing the Christian faith. And all of a sudden, the Lord appears to him in a great light, so much so that it blinds him. In verses 9 through 18, a disciple from Damascus is asked to go and to witness to the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul had such a reputation that every believer feared his very name. When they would say, Saul of Tarsus is in our city, every Christian would hide. When they said, Saul of Tarsus is headed our way, then I want to be headed the opposite way. And I'm sure that as an angelic presence came and went to Ananias in in Damascus and told him, I want you to go and give testimony to and witness truth to Saul of Tarsus, he said, are you kidding me? Do you know what he does to Christians? But he's prepared, and he's awaiting you. And the Bible says in Acts 9, 18, that Ananias comes into the house where Saul was there. And when presented the truth, the Bible tells us that it was like scales had been removed from his eyes, and suddenly he was able to see. Why? Why? because he was changed from the inside out. And the Bible says immediately after that happened, he was baptized. September 20th, in just a couple of weeks, we're going to be having a baptism service here at First Baptist Church. If you've ever considered the opportunity to declare your faith and tell others that you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to encourage you We'd like for you to be a part of that baptism service. If you'll let me know any time during this coming week or the following, uh, just call us here at the church office or, or email me at, at mhern at duluthbaptist.org. We'd love to talk with you about how to make that next step. That if you're a believer, the next step is to be baptized. It declares to the world Christ is living inside of you. In 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 2, it says, Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. Scales will be removed from our eyes. We'll see Jesus as he actually is. And the Bible says we will be like him. Charles Wesley was an 18th century hymn writer. He and his brother, John Wesley, are oftentimes attributed with being the 
founders of the Methodist movement. But Charles was most noted for being a hymn writer. And maybe his most famous of all hymns was Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Joy of heaven to earth come down, fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. That great hymn was uh, first granted notoriety when it was placed in a hymnal, and I love the name of this hymnal. The name of the hymnal was Hymns for Those That Seek and Have Redemption in the Blood of Christ. Hymns for Those Who Seek and Have Redemption in the Blood of Christ. In the fourth stanza of that hymn, it says, Changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our, cast our crowns before him, Lord of wonder, love, and praise. He took that directly from 2 Corinthians 3.18. That when we are taken into heaven, we remove from the glory that we have experienced upon this earth to eternal glory in the heavens, changed from glory into glory. You see, when Jesus shines upon us, we are converted. We're confident in that we have hope. We're cleared and that we're free from the power and the presence of sin. We are converted and changed from glory into glory. But then as chapter 4 unfolds, he takes a turn. He says not only what happens when his face is shining, but what happens when his face is shielded. And there are three negative developments, first of all. Our manners become shameful. In verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have this ministry because we're shown mercy, we do not give up. Instead, we've renounced secret and shameful things, not acting deceitfully or distorting the Word of God, but commending ourselves before God to everyone's conscience by an open display of the truth. He says, Because of this gospel, the gospel that has been referred to in chapter 3, we just continue to keep plugging. We don't give up because we know that people can be changed and we know that lives can be altered. And in verse 2, he says, we renounce those shameful things of our past. The shameful portions of our ministry. Now, how so? What is it about the past that had been declared shameful? And he says, it's because of deceitfulness. That word deceitfully is actually a word that meant or described being able to put bait or, or to trap someone. Gospel is not an entrapment procedure. One pastor of my friend, friend of mine used to describe his philosophy of ministry as get all you can, can all you get, then sit on top of the can. And unfortunately, that seems to be really so during COVID-19. Because everybody's afraid we're going to lose everybody in the church. I, I've, I've been seeing all kinds of, of just devastating data out there. 20% of churches in America will probably not survive COVID-19. 20% of church members in America will not return to their church after COVID-19. Now, I don't know how that someone is able to predict those things, but what I do know is that it does not tell us that that's okay for us to just entrap people deceitfully. That is not what the gospel is about. What churches need to talk about is less about preservation and more about transformation, that the God who changed my life has the authority and the ability to change others' lives, and we need to be sharing it. When God's face is hitting, our manner of thinking and the way in which we do things becomes shameful. But when God's face is hidden, not only are our manners becoming shameful, but our minds are becoming shut off. False teachers will begin to claim to be scriptural, and we will not know the difference. Verse 3 says, But if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Blinded their minds... 
Paul said lost people are veiled to truth. They, it's not that they don't have truth. Oftentimes it's because they don't see the truth. And they don't see the truth because someone needs to take and pull back the veil. I read a story, a true story, about a major multi-car accident that took place in the foggy streets of, of England. It started with one car that hit the back of a truck, but the fog was so incredibly thick that eventually car after car began to pile up into this massive debris. When the police finally arrived with their flashing blue lights, the fog was so thick that people still could not see the flashing blue lights, entered into the danger zone at a high rate of speed, and also became a part of the casualties. People were so incredibly frustrated that they took orange cones and were throwing them into the windshield of approaching vehicles to try to get their attention to slow down. But they weren't paying attention to the warning signs. The word veiled means oblivious to the warnings. And one of the biggest problems in America on the roadways today is distracted driving. And one of the biggest problems in the church in America today are distracted believers. People that have forgotten what the main thing is, is to exalt Christ and to look, turn people towards him. And we become distracted in our methodologies, distracted in our methods, distracted in our motives, and because of that, we have lost the glory of God. Our manners have become shameful. Our minds have become shut off. And then thirdly, our motives have become selfish. In verse 5 of the text, it says, For we are not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. We're not proclaiming ourselves. It's not about me. An old Maranatha praise song used to say, Make me a servant humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. And may the prayer of my heart always be, Make me a servant. Make me a servant. Make me a servant today. Oh, how we need to be seeking servanthood and not sovereignty. It's not about who's in control. It's about who's willing to serve others. That's why Jesus said in John 20, 26, whoever wants to become great among you must be a servant. But then in verse 6 it says, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. What we're about is letting people see the light that shines through Jesus. I love this story by Max Lucado. He tells about going to Disney World. And anyone who's ever been to Disney World knows that the iconic Cinderella's Castle in the center of of Disney World is, is central. From almost every area of the park, you converge upon the castle. It's one of the first things that children want to, to see. It's one of the things in which every family wants to have their picture made in front of. Cinderella's castle is the supreme event. And Lucado said that they had just arrived in Disney. They walked down Main Street, went to Cinderella's castle, and said children of all ages were just filled with glee as they walked through when all of a sudden he said, I noticed everyone was moving to one side of the castle. He said, had it been a boat, we would have tipped over because we saw everybody moving to one side. He thought, what had caused such a tremendous amount of commotion? Cinderella had appeared. And every child wanted to be at the foot of the princess. He said, I noticed that there was one boy He said, I'd estimate him to be about seven, eight years of age. He was in a wheelchair. He had obvious deformities that he didn't know was caused by accident or whether it had been by birth. 
But he was away from the rest of the crowd, but still trying to capture a glimpse of the princess. And he thought, oh, how I wish that the princess would see him. And he said, no sooner did I pass through my mind when the princess did see him and made her way through the crowd of other youngsters until finally she got up next to him, knelt down to where that he was at, she, she was at his eye level and gave him a kiss on the cheek. Lucado said, I thought what a wonderful, what a wonderful gesture. And he said it reminded me of something that was done 2,000 years ago. It wasn't a princess. It was the Prince of Peace. It wasn't a little boy in a wheelchair. It was a thief on a cross. In both cases, a gift was given. In both cases, love was shared. In both cases, the lovely... The beautiful one performed a genuine act of love upon the one who had been rejected by the world. But Jesus did far more than Cinderella. Cinderella gave only a kiss. When she stood to leave, she took her beauty with her. The boy was still having to deal with the challenges of his everyday life. But what if Cinderella had done what Jesus did? What? What if she had assumed the boy's position? What if she had somehow said, I will give my beauty for you, and I will take your struggles upon me? That's what Jesus did. He took our suffering upon himself. He felt our pain for us. He was wounded for the wrongs that we had performed. He was crushed for the evil that we had done. The punishment which made us well was given to him, and we are healed by his wounds. Jesus gave more than a kiss, he gave his beauty. He paid more than a visit. He paid for our mistakes. And he took more than a minute because he took away all of our sin. That Jesus does not want to be masked to this world. He wants to be known to this world. That Jesus does not want to have his identity concealed. He does not want to be masked to where that he cannot affect the world. He wants to be released so that he can shine upon this world because that Jesus who performed that miracle to the thief on the cross performed that miracle in me as a nine-year-old boy, performed that miracle in many of you, and he wants us to release him to shine upon this world. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Let's pray together. God, I'm so grateful for what you've done in my life. <clears throat> I never want to, to hide from the world who I am, who I belong to, and who I owe everything to. And so, Lord, I don't want to mask anything about you in my life. I want people to see you in me. And God, as we sang this morning, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this world with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. God, I pray that we would be more in love with you, more in tune with you, more desiresome of you, and more wanting to share you with the world because of what you've done in me. May I do it for the rest of the world. 
For I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.